Hello, I'm Chris Burns, and welcome to The Network, where we connect into a matrix of newsmakers to get to the heart of an issue. And watch out, they've got to answer in 25 seconds or less, or else. Let's take a look at that issue right now. Thank you so much. It was a hard-fought campaign, the most expensive in history. And despite President Obama's re-election, the country remains deeply divided, with the Republicans still controlling the House of Representatives. Domestically, the so-called fiscal cliff comes in January. Automatic spending cuts and tax increases if there's no new budget agreement. Those cuts could trigger a recession with global impact. After all the China bashing during the campaign, how to appease calls to crack down on China's huge trade surplus without triggering a trade war? In civil war racked Syria, is it time to intervene? The same for Iran's nuclear program that edges ever closer to bomb-making potential. In Eastern Europe, what is the future for missile defense? How to pursue relations with Russia under a new Putin presidency? How will those issues impact Europe? What should be Europe's approach toward Obama's second term? Will there be any honeymoon at all? Now wired into this edition of the network is here from the European Parliament in Brussels, Rafał Trzaskowski, a Polish MEP who's on the delegation for relations with the United States. Also here at the Parliament, Mike Kulbikas, chairman of the Republicans Abroad in Belgium. And from the Euronews studio in Brussels, Matthew Newman, spokesperson for Democrats Abroad. Let me uh, pitch a question to all of you, uh, starting with Rafal. How dangerous is the fiscal cliff we just talked about for the U.S. and the rest of the world? And whose fault is it if we get there? Rafal. Well, look at the European experience and the uncontrolled deficits, you know, grave problems. And when you look at the United States, you know, I was there at the Capitol Hill in the 90s working as an intern. And both parties were reaching out to have a consensus, bipartisanship on difficult problems. And this is gone. This is a fault of both parties. Mike, uh, what do you think? Whose fault is it going to be? It looks like we're headed there, aren't we? Uh, I think it's very likely that we'll fall off the fiscal cliff. To, and there's many reasons for that. The 2010 elections uh, gave the, the, the House of Representatives a mandate for opposition to President uh, Obama's policies. And his transformational agenda is likely to run into a brick wall there. He'll need the cooperation of them to avoid a second recession, which is likely. Matthew, uh, well, how do you answer that? Nobody in America wants to see the results of the fiscal cliff. And it's also clear that America deserves to have, to be, uh, have its children grow up in a debt, uh, not a debt-burdened America, in a deficit-burdened okay. America. Okay, but who, who, what kind of impact could we see on the rest of the world, Rafal? Well, I mean, first of all, we can see that, you know, big economies have impact on the rest of the world and that the European crisis has impact also on the United States and vice versa. The whole crisis started in the United States in 2008 and we are living in a world which is connected and both countries and both regions have huge okay. effects on each other. And that's the problem. That's why we have to worry about what's happening in the U.S. Okay, Mike, let's, let's turn I, to U.S., EU. I'm sorry, go ahead. You were going to no, say something. I was going to say that I think that President Obama is going to launch a, a, an all-out war against the legitimacy of the uh, House of Representatives' opposition to his policies and that we're going to end up with, constant, with the possibility of very severe constitutional crises and that in eight years, we're going, after eight years of Obama's rule, we're going to end up exactly where we are today and, eight, and four years ago. And Matthew, I guess you probably don't see it that way. Let's be clear about this. Uh, the uh, automatic uh, spending cuts, that's not... President Obama's idea. This was Congress's idea. No, but that's, that's not true. That's, that's not true. Bob oh. Woodward has pointed out in his book how the sequestration idea was fa formulated in the White House. Okay, we could go through this for, for, for the next half hour, but let me, let me shift, shift over to uh, U.S.-EU relations. And how do you think the second Obama term uh, could, could perhaps change the relations? Could we actually finally see a data protection law, Rafal? Well, first of all, I mean, I think that the second Obama administration is not going to be so messianistic in its approach. It will just get down and resolve certain problems. And I think that during the second term, Obama has realized that he has to work with the European Union if he is to resolve any global problems. And he started treating us more seriously, and that is well for the future. Okay. Uh, Matthew, how do you see that? And, and could, could we see a data protection law, for instance? Let's think about the global picture about this relationship and how tight the bonds are. Um, that's what really matters. And I think that 
President Obama represents uh, a multilateral approach rather than a go-alone cowboy-style approach that we've seen uh, early, with earlier uh, All right, but Mike, Mike uh, let, let, let's have you react I think on we that. Forget, I think we forget when we talk about data protection, we're talking about the data, sh principally the data sharing that was necessary in fighting the war on terrorism. And th there, were, there were specific reasons why the United States needed to have this data in order to secure uh, its, uh, its airspace. So I, I think you're indeed they're, they're right that most likely President Obama will be willing to sacrifice the security of American people in order, because he has a vision which is very similar to as if he is, as if he is uh, having the security concerns of America. The problem is that America's security concerns are not the same as Europeans' concern, security concerns. So data protection law, probably it's coming. Is that no. going to be in the best interest of the American people? I, I don't think so. What about, uh, now let's, let's shift over to a couple of the hot spots, Syria, uh, and uh, let's talk about Iran. Should, do you think that the U.S. is going to intervene in those, in those theaters, uh, Rafal? Well, I mean, uh, when it comes to Syria, we should do something about it, that's for sure. But we remain divided even in the European Union, and we cannot really rely on the support from some other players, such as, for example, Russia or China. When it comes to Iran, at least here we are on the same page in the European Union and on the same page with the Americans. And I think that at least we should fight for keeping up that position and exerting certain pressure on the uh, regime in Tehran. Matthew, how do you see that? Absolutely. What we need is uh, to keep up the pressure. Um, we need to have more um, organized uh, humanitarian assistance uh, for Syrian people who are suffering greatly. Um, I see uh, President Obama uh, providing that leadership. Uh, he's already done that. Okay, and but what also, about intervention? What about something like uh, airstrikes, no-fly zone, uh, something like that, arming the rebels? Well, I think it's clear that uh, President Obama has spent his... Uh, uh, first term getting the United States out of wars. Uh, that's what the American people want. Uh, it's not uh, someone who's uh, a warmonger who's going to uh, start uh, bombing uh, countries uh, easily. Um, that's not what you can expect. Mike, how I do you see it, that? I find it really remarkable still that Democrats talk about America being a warmonger when we're talking about a Syrian regime which has killed 30,000 of its own civilians and we stand by and do nothing. Okay, what about, what about missile defense? Do you think uh, Obama will press ahead with missile defense, uh, Rafal? Well, first of all, one comment to my friends. Guys, I mean, the campaign is over. I mean, let's get down to business and discuss the issues. I mean, when it comes to missile defense, I think that Obama um, actually learned something during his, his first term, and I think that they will start thinking about it in seriousness, what to do to make uh, not only Europe, but also the United States more secure. The missile defense is dead because uh, the main places where those uh, sites were going to be is in Poland and Czech, Czech Republic, and Obama, President Obama pulled the rug out from under of the, uh, both of those countries when he did the so-called reset uh, with Russia. Mr. Romney had been saying that, that uh, China should be branded as a currency manipulator. There's going to be pressure on Obama from the Congress to do something about that. What is Mr. Obama going to be able to do? Matthew. Um, the, the situation has completely changed. Um, look at the, the facts. Uh, the Chinese currency has actually gone up 3% since 2008. Um, if you look at their current account surplus, it's um, gone from uh, ten percent to down to two percent. Okay, so there right, really but, is no justification for it. Okay, but but Mike, do you think that's a mistake? The real problem is uh, what happens to our allies like Japan and uh, and, uh, and Australia and those other countries which are facing right. European dom do uh, sorry do Chinese dominance. President Obama is projecting an incredible weakness in the Pacific that is okay. going to be provocative for Chinese military power. Let's, uh, the final, final question to Rafal. Uh, this, this is a bit r related to that because Mr. Obama has been shifting his attention toward Asia. How much does that trouble the EU and could that render NATO obsolete? Well, I think this, this is a stereotype. I mean, during the second part of its term, you know, uh, the Americans and Obama's administration found out that to actually resolve any of the global, global problems, when we talk about Middle East, Iran, when we talk about fighting terrorism or whatsoever, we have to do it together. I mean, we're the biggest allies when it comes to trade also. And if we are to resolve any of those problems, we have to do it together. Thanks, Rafal. Thanks to all of you. That's all the time we've got for now. I'd like to thank our guests. Rafael Chaskovsky, Mike Kulbikas, and Matthew Newman. I'm Chris Burns, and until next time, thanks for connecting with The Network.